Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage moderators Adam Carbolito and Jennifer Vanderhyde and our distinguished panel. Half a day and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, I just want to thank APAX um, and all the staff for hosting this event. This really is uh, an important event to discuss issues that are important to Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. Uh, I will say as a native Chamorro who grew up in Guam, uh, as I'm sure is the sentiment for many of you, uh, these issues are deeply personal to us, to our families, and, the, and to the communities in which we live. Today we're going to discuss efforts in Congress to address health disparities uh, and bicameral legislation that specifically targets uh, the inequities experienced in communities, in communities of color. Since 2007, the Health Equity and Accountability Act, or HEA, has served as a blueprint for improving how our communities interact with and within the healthcare system. And we have seen many legislative victories come out of HIA since it was first introduced in 2007. I will say that unlike most other pieces of legislation that you may be familiar with, HIA is a living piece of legislation that evolves with each Congress as provisions are incorporated into law and it changes in order to address the many changing needs of underserved communities. And HIA is 10 titles long, it spans over 2,000 pages, uh, and I had to write these down so that you could uh, get a breath, uh, a sense of the breadth of how big this bill is. It addresses data collection and reporting, culturally and linguistically appropriate health and healthcare, health workforce diversity, improving health access and quality, improving health outcomes for women, children, and families, mental health and substance use conditions, addressing high impact minority diseases, health information technology, accountability and evaluation in healthcare, and, a, and finally, addressing social determinants of health and improving environmental justice. And HIA really is unique in that it brings together community organizations, national and state advocates, industry partners, and lawmakers, all with an interest to ensuring everyone in our country, especially communities of color, can get affordable, high quality, and accessible healthcare when they need it. Today, I am truly honored uh, to join this incredible panel, along with my co-moderator and a fellow former Hill Chief of Staff, Jennifer Vanderhyde, with the Asian and Pacific Islander American Health Forum, to discuss HIA uh, as a blueprint for addressing health needs of Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders, and truly all communities of color. Jennifer, let me turn it over to you to get us started. Thank you so much, Adam, and thank you, Apex, for uh, the honor of being here today. I wanted to offer just uh, two brief reflections. When I came to Capitol Hill as former Congressman uh, Honda's chief of staff in 2001, there was no congressional tri-caucus, the Asian, Black, and Hispanic caucus. And through the process of building that caucus, it was, it was actually in 2003 that the first Health Equality and Accountability Act was introduced. Um, then by the late Congressman Elijah Cummings, uh, former Congressman Ciro Rodriguez, former Congressman Mike Honda, and Senator Daschle. Um, at that time, it was not the almost 2,000 pages that I think this bill is going to be, and I think that really reflects the growth of um, the HIA bill through Congress and um, the really extraordinary effort and community-driven effort that HIA has become. And I was reflecting on the previous panel around diversity in government, thinking about how personnel truly is policy. So if you think about the diversification, certainly from my perspective in Congress, of staff on the Hill, and the growth of what HIA has become as smarter, much more inclusive, comprehensive policy, meant to address all of the health equity gaps um, for Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islanders, and people of color across the country. That is really, in part, reflective of that growth. And then, thank you, uh, final thought is thanking APACS, because I think every 
well, excluding me, every person on this panel is a former uh, Apex fellow, and certainly in Congressman Honda's office, we had uh, the benefit of having a fellow every single Congress, sometimes more than one. And those fellows have become the staff that are writing these bills, that are working with the community and bringing all of your incredible input in. So again, thank you to Apex. And with that, we're going to hear from each of our panelists. I get to start with Casey Lee um, to hear about their position and what their office's role is in developing HIA. Hi, everyone. My name is Casey. I am the policy advisor at the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, or KPAC for short. Before that, I was a staffer on the House Judiciary Committee, and before that, I was an APACS fellow with Congressman Ted Liu. So very honored to be here and speaking at the APACS LLS. Um, in terms of KPAC, in case you are not familiar with us, we are a caucus that is the voice for Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders throughout the halls of Congress, addressing the needs and concerns of our issues and, um, you know, through legislation and making sure we are uplifting representation of us in all levels. So what KPAC does in terms of HIA, the Health Equity and Accountability Act, is we are part of the Tri Caucus, like mentioned before, the CBC and CHC and KPAC form the Tri Caucus in every Congress. We take turns and introduce this amazing comprehensive bill that is the roadmap to addressing health equity. We'll dive into more of the details in a little bit, I think, but KPAC is comprised right now of 72 members, um, both AA and HPI members, and also champions for our communities who have high constituencies in their district. And in addition to health equity, we also do a lot of other issues, um, including civil rights, voting rights, economic development, housing, immigration, education, uh, just all the issues that really affect us, data disaggregation, language access, um, and we are, you know, again, the united voice for all the AA and HPIs in Congress. And extremely excited to be here and talk more about here with you all. Great, thank you so much, Casey. Next, we have Erica Ninoyu from uh, Congresswoman Barbara Lee's office, the Healthcare Task Force Chair. Hi, everyone. Uh, so good to be with you. Uh, Erica Ninoyu, uh, I am uh, Congressman Barbara Lee's senior legislative assistant. Um, big thank you to Apex as well. I was a fellow uh, with uh, Congresswoman Grace Meng uh, during my first year and now um, al almost three years with uh, Congressman Barbara Lee. She, of course, is KPAC's Health Task Force co-chair, and so that is why uh, we have the privilege of um, uh, editing and putting the, the <laughs> here together for this Congress. Um, but she is also uh, on the, the CBC domestic Health Task Force. So last Congress, we worked really hand in hand with uh, Rep Kelly's office, the CBC Health Brain Trust, to reintroduce that version. Uh, so my boss, you know, really she came to the Hill through the personal experiences and the strife and the struggles and representing and wanting to make that change. And with that, um, uh, you know, such a bill like HIA is very much a symbol of uh, that kind of action that we want to see, the changes we want to see, applying the racial, uh, racial uh, equity lens to everything that happens, everything that our policy touches, because as we all know, you know, back in the day, even now, uh, the policy was not built for people like us. So it is an absolute privilege uh, to be in this position on the Hill to work on, um, I work on domestic policy and my boss is an appropriator, uh, federal funding. Um, so we'll talk more about here later. Great, thank you, Erica. And next we have Jade Rowland from Senator Maisie Hirono's office. Hi everyone, my name is Jade. I am the Senator, Senator Hirono's legislative aide. I cover the health and reproductive rights portfolio areas for the Senator, and I was most recently a APAC's Congressional Fellow in Senator Hirono's office. Um, and I wanna extend my gratitude to APAC for bringing us together to talk about health equity for communities of color. Um, a little bit of history, um, we touched on it a little bit, but Senator Hirono has led HIA in the 115th and 116th Congress and will again lead it in the 118th Congress. Um, prior to Senator Hirono leading, um, Senator Akaka of Hawaii led it. Um, and 
this bill serves as an opportunity to uplift the priorities of all stakeholders invested in um, addressing health disparities for communities of color, particularly Asian, and for my boss, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander community populations. Great, thank you so much. And we have Tony Tran from CHC Chairwoman Nanette Barragan's office. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Tony Tran. I'm with the, the Health Legislative Assistant for Congresswoman Nanette Diaz Barragan uh, from California's 44th Congressional District. Um, so glad to be here and thank you for APAX for inviting me over. I'm here because I'm, you know, be able to share some perspectives from my boss, who is currently the chairwoman of the Hispanic Caucus and the importance of HIA and what it brings and the ability of HIA to reduce and sort of create a new playbook for public health and healthcare um, disparities and actions, federal investments and actions to address these disparities and, and inequities for all communities of color and especially for Hispanic um, and Latino communities, which are disproportionately impacted by so many chronic diseases, for example, Alzheimer's disease and stuff like that. So very happy to sort of dive in into HIA and talk more about it. Great, thank you. Yeah, thanks Tony and thanks everyone. Um, so I wanna zoom out a little bit um, and maybe I can go to Casey and Tony given uh, that you both work for the leadership of uh, the, very, uh, the two caucuses uh, that your bosses uh, currently chair. And I wanna zoom out and talk about health equity as a concept first. I think health equity is such a buzzword um, and we hear it a lot uh, uh, and it's thrown around often. So just so that we can come to a shared understanding, uh, what is health equity? How do your bosses uh, address it? And uh, how does the tri caucus address health equity through here? Sure, I'll go first. So health equity is really the state in which all individuals, um, regardless of background, our beautiful, unique stories can uh, achieve the highest levels of health for ourselves and have the just and fair opportunity to get to those levels of health. And through HIA and other work buckets that our bosses are working on, uh, we can pursue health equity by really overcoming the social, economic, et cetera, barriers to health and health care. We can also look into how we want to eliminate preventable health disparities within our communities too. And so kind of in a nutshell, it's about how we grapple and tackle generational injustice that our communities of color, our AA and HPI communities have, you know, unfortunately undergone throughout the years and years of us being here, how we can really grapple with those. So with HIA, like Adam mentioned, there are 10 different titles or kind of topics that we address. And the ones I'll mention just really quickly that really address AA and HPI issues specifically are detailed data collection. We have so many ethnicities and subgroups within the A and HPI umbrella, and obviously we all have disparities within that umbrella, in addition to the disparities that, you know, um, that the black community, that the Hispanic community also face. Um, we also speak many, many different languages, and that's why there is also a specific title about cultural and linguistically appropriate services too for our communities. Um, lastly, we know that A and HPIs face a lot of different disparities in specific diseases, um, cancer, tuberculosis, hepatitis B, and again, like that's within different specific communities within our AA and HPI umbrella. So with HIA, we're hoping to you know, address all these different issues. Um, and as far as how the Tri Caucus really participates in this, Again, every Congress, we take turns to introduce this landmark bill. Um, like Erica mentioned, last Congress, uh, the CBC and uh, Congresswoman Robin Kelly really were the leaders on this, and we worked very closely with them. Um, they did a beautiful handoff to us with uh, KPAC. Uh, Congresswoman Lee and Senator Hirono, and after that we're really going to work closely with the CHC as well for the 119th Congress. Yeah, and happy to sort of talk more about, you know, um, CHC, the Hispanic Caucus, Hispanic Caucus um, introduced HIA in the 116th Congress, uh, Congressman Chuy Garcia, and then um, Chairman Joaquin Castro introduced HIA with the uh, Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus and Congressional Black Caucus uh, back in 2020 during the 116th Congress. So um, it's a cycle that keeps going on and we keep working collaboratively with partners from the other caucuses to introduce the bill every year. And we're looking forward to working very closely on HIA this year and, you know, uh, for a clean handoff for next Congress, um, then, um, you know, 
looking forward to sort of addressing health equities. And I think something to focus on is that Tau 10 of uh, PIA focuses on improving social determinants of health, and that's an issue area that my boss deeply cares about. The, uh, the chairman, every year we introduce our Improving Social Determinants of Health Act, which would pretty much promulgate grants and funding to states, um, CDC, and local uh, community-based organizations to sort of address uh, barriers uh, to healthcare that are social in nature. Uh, for example, in LA County, um, you wouldn't know it, but there's so many refineries and um, industrial machinery and factories in the district. And so when my boss, uh, Congressman, was uh, running for Congress and talking about inequities uh, that she deeply cares about and heard about was that so many people in the district were having asthma, rates of increased lung cancer, because all these refineries were pumping um, sort of gases and other particles in the air and people wouldn't know it. And so the improving social determinants of health sort of section of here is so important for Hispanic communities because a lot of Hispanic and Latino communities disp disproportionately live and are in communities that unfortunately are near sort of these industrial plants, industrial areas, near areas of toxic pollutants and stuff like that. And so the environmental justice component that HIA brings, the social health the component that HIA brings to sort of recognize that and sort of change the playbook and how we address those issue areas is really important for Hispanic and Latino communities that something my boss has worked on and we continue to work on um, every Congress and especially some more so this Congress uh, with the HIA bill and um, my boss being chairwoman of the caucus. Great. Thank you, Tony. In thinking about, um, I spent 20 years as the chief of staff in Congress, and I cannot think of a piece of legislation that is so comprehensive, that is so inclusive of community input, um, really listening to stakeholders involved, and that is so reflective of the health equity needs of Asian Americans, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islanders, and other people of color across the country. And um, I'm interested, I think that everyone here is interested in knowing, um, Erica and Jade, if you can tell us a little bit more about what does it mean to have this blueprint, to have this legislation in Congress, and what is the significance of putting this together? So I guess starting with Erica. Or, or either. either way. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think it's important when we talk about HIA as a blueprint, maybe to set some foundation knowledge. Um, when we talk about it, we don't say reintroduction. This is an introduction to a living document, as Adam said. Um, we, it's a pretty uniquely constructed bill because we, we engage, it's rooted in community engagement. We have, I believe, over 100 community serving organizations that help provide feedback and help us identify areas of implementation that Erica is going to expand upon. Um, but this is also something um, that we have intention of implementing, but we've already done that, right? Senator Hirono in 2020 restored uh, Medicaid eligibility for COFA citizens, the Compact of Freely Associated States, including Palau, Micronesia, and the Marshallese Islands. Um, and this was something that they've been denied for over 20 years and something that the senator for nearly a decade was advocating for. Um, and as we look looking forward, we use HIA as a blueprint to identify policies that are led by different members of the Tri-Caucus to find areas where we can implement it either through legislative actions or administrative fixes. Um. And um, to add to that, uh, well, first, you know, HIA would not be possible each Congress without the community working groups. And so thank you so much to uh, the Health Forum, API Health Forum, who's done this every cycle for at least, you know, 2000, uh, 112th, 115th, and now the 118th. And then, Adam, thank you so much for <laughs> uh, standing up to our call to, um, uh, for APCHO to take on, uh, and for both of the organizations to anchor uh, the community working groups. Uh, and as Jade said, we usually have about 100, uh, and he has such a great opportunity to bring the community together. And uh, you know, I think one of the rare moments that we really function as a tri-caucus to do that, and in a bicameral way. And really excited that Senator Hirono and Jade is on board from the, uh, the editing phase, because oftentimes House does its thing and then <laughs> Senate does its thing afterwards. But we were really working hand in hand and uh, in order to really implement and uplift the fact uh, that HIA is the blueprint for our communities, 
uh, we've decided to reintroduce HIA a year earlier. Typically, it happens during the second Congress, uh, second session of Congress uh, in April during Minority Health Month. Uh, but we said, why not introduce first session so we have extra time to implement and build upon the, the previous successes. Uh, and so the hope here is that we coalesce together around HIA. It's not just the cycle, but a living, breathing document and a framework and a guide that really comes up every time we talk about health equity. Uh, because, you know, while passing legislation is important, uh, it is also powerful in coalescing our communities and giving people and organizations the political coverage that they need to do that work, and not to mention administration, and really mobilize everyone together under that effort. So the document, Hopefully it's not 2,000 pages <laughs> this time around, but uh, it is really valuable in that sense that uh, it's, it's symbolic uh, in, in all of the efforts that happens you know, in our communities every day. Um, and so uh, just looking forward to working with all of you uh, throughout uh, this Congress and, uh, and then uh, tri-caucuses and <laughs> future Congresses. Thank you, and I think we're down to 1,800 pages, so don't worry. <laughs> um, so before we get to questions from the audience, um, HIA is a living document, and it's also an aspirational document. But we also know that there are real challenges that our communities are facing now that need to ad be addressed in legislation now. Um, you know, there is uh, the end of the public health emergency that the Biden administration just uh, announced or just made finalized uh, this week. Medicaid unwinding is causing significant challenges in communities across the country, particularly for underserved and poorer communities. Uh, there are challenges with mental health uh, and the need for Congress to provide more resources for mental health. The Community Health Center uh, program needs to be reauthorized that provide critical services to underserved communities uh, and their workforce challenges uh, throughout the country. So, you know, as we're talking about HIA, um, maybe uh, Jade, uh, Erica, Casey, if you can talk a little bit more about how HIA will impact current legislation um, and what are your visions for how we can utilize this document and this piece of legislation to have an influence on current pieces of legislation that may actually be moving? Sure, I'll go first. Um, so you mentioned Medicaid unwinding, and that's something that the chairwoman of KPAC, Congresswoman Judy Chu, is very deeply concerned about. I know the chairs of the Tri-Caucus are also monitoring this issue very, very closely. And to give a little context of what's going on with that, so three years ago, you know, in the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, Congress passed legislation to, you know, allow folks to keep their Medicaid coverage. And that's it's essentially life-changing for a lot of people during this public health emergency, um, especially for our low-income individuals, our communities of color, our immigrant communities. What happened in this past December was that during the passage and drafting of the omnibus spending bill, there was also a provision that said, hey, we're going to um, end this Medicaid continuous coverage requirement uh, effective March 31st of 2023, meaning that states and territories on April 1st of this year could begin to redetermine Medicaid eligibility and start terminating families again. So obviously a lot of flags are raised about that, especially knowing that millions of people of color um, an estimated 1 million AANHPIs are projected to lose Medicaid coverage because of this process. Um, the extra layer of that, which I mentioned earlier, is AANHPIs, one third of us are limited English proficient. And so when we think about this wonky process that I just tried describing to you all, how are we reaching the folks in our communities who are limited English proficient. So I think the really cool thing about HIA and like an opportunity we can expand on that is in that title about culturally appropriate, linguistically appropriate care. Um, you know, it's one thing to make sure our healthcare providers are serving our communities, they know how to speak our languages. We also need to make sure that the outreach, that the information that we're disseminating to our communities are also in the languages that they can understand and fully grasp. Because when they go and fill out you know, these forms to renew Medicaid and whatnot, um, we need to make sure that they understand what's going on, that they're able to fill it out correctly because 
projected more than half of the people of color will be terminated um, from Medicaid despite being still eligible because of paperwork driven terminations because of administrative burdens on states and territories. So again, hoping that HIA is a really, you know, golden opportunity that we can think about, okay, what are the types of materials we're disseminating to our communities? How are we telling them about this process? How are we making sure that we are raising the alarm bells for them too? Just add to that, uh, you know, I think it's so important that he has a living, breathing document because we, there were a lot of lessons learned, a lot of hardship, but lessons learned uh, during the pandemic and, uh, you know, still the ongoing impacts. Uh, but, um, you know, access to healthcare is something that uh, is a commonality through most aspects, most titles uh, within HIA and a lot of our work that we do in health equity. And we saw some movement through the administration, building of task forces. You know, these are pieces that we've been calling for through uh, the bill for quite a while. So uh, just to, it's also a great measure to say, what were we asking for? What have we achieved? Uh, and so it's, you know, illuminating a little bit of a celebration when we can actually take things out of here, like the COFA uh, pieces. But um, all to say that, you know, our, our communities, our needs are also changing. Uh, last Congress, we added a AI bias uh, a section calling for a task force. And you know the opportunity that HIA provides is we can dig deeper into not just what are the needs for communities of color, but how are each uniquely different, and what do those uh, policy changes, uh, the incentives needed, uh, you know, policy changes needed uh, for that. So um, you know, you looking through the bill, um, you know, also uh, uh, quite a. Um, uh, uh, priority for my boss is the high impact diseases section. Uh, for instance, uh, HIV, uh, ending the HIV initiative has, you know, uh, pandemic has, uh, or epidemic has come a long ways and we finally have, you know, a generic version of a PEP, for instance. And so how do those innovations and advancements change, you know, our reaction and what kind of policies do we need uh, to make sure that access and uh, wraparound health care services uh, is there. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's really interesting to be a part of HIA uh, through different perspectives, each uh, Congress and, um, you know, just such a valuable document and, um, you know, hopefully we can do more with implementation <laughs> this year. Um, and I'll draw upon the this, the mental health crisis that you talked about, Adam. In the Senate, there's, um, we're currently in a nationwide mental health crisis and there's a lot of appetite in the Senate for bipartisan solutions. Um, but it's important to acknowledge that they, these solutions can't be broad and they need to, they, they should be broad, but they should be um, inclusive of different communities of color. When we talk about specifically the A and HPI community, about 77% um, percent of A and HPI with a mental health condition don't seek treatment. And this isn't something that's talked about unless you know, leaders of communities that, rep that represent constituents from these communities would know and be able to bring that into policy. Um, so that's something that here, we have a whole title dedicated to mental health. Um, those proposals have already been vetted by community organizations, they've been vetted by our congressional offices, and they're ready for being implemented and suggested to those who are moving these big bills forward to address this national broad issue. I, think, um, I just wanted to underscore Casey's point as well on the Medicaid redetermination. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but just yesterday the number, some numbers came out from the state of Arkansas which decided to speed up the redetermination process. And there were some, I think it's in the like 45,000 people dropped from Medicaid already. 85% of those were for procedural reasons. So thinking about, right, and we know we have large COFA populations there, thinking about the need for language access, um, you know, for call centers that have translators that are gonna be helping people to go through this, it's just, it's so critical and, and it's a, a, living, a living example of why this bill is so important, so. Absolutely. So I think we have some time for questions. All right, in the back. 
Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Nelson Garcia. I'm the new director of Federal Affairs for Compassion and Choices. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization uh, dedicated to preserving and protecting the rights of the terminally ill uh, for end of life care. And I know he uh, has been trying to address the issue of end of, li end of life care in this legislation. This may add another couple of thousand uh, pages on your bill uh, <laughs> as a result. Uh, but nevertheless, we just want to shout out uh, on that issue because this is something that I think, for the most part, Asian Americans as a demographic has a propensity of living a very long life, but at the same time they have a propensity of not necessarily being covered by insurance or have access to insurance. And when they are facing a terminally ill situation, either themselves or their family, um, the access to uh, medicine um, to alleviate the pain and suffering on those last months is something that's very important, I think, uh, for the community to address. And so hopefully the bill that you are putting together the, 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 that's ongoing uh, would address that issue as well as we move forward. And I will say we would love to partner with you and uh, to work with you right now. Okay, <laughs> well I will say the community working group is uh, undergoing the rewrite process now. Uh, so would love to get your input on the relevant section and see if I can connect you with the title lead for it. I know that they're w trying to work diligently because Erica and Jade have put a quite ambitious timeline for us to get legislative text back. But really, we do want this to be a marker bill. We want it to be something that can be a repository for other pieces of legislation that maybe move and uh, that may move in the future, so that we can pull out provisions like we've done in the past and insert them into other uh, priority pieces of legislation that are moving through both the House and the Senate. Uh, as well as if there are ways that uh, the administration can work on it without legislation, um, having it in here is an opportunity for our congressional champions to ping the administration as well as advocates to work with the administration to get something done um, that may only require regulatory change. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Kimberly Colbert. I'm a critical ethnic studies, uh, English language, art, language arts teacher from St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, and I'm wondering, um, well, in the 1990s, there was a physician by the name of Deborah Prothero Stith, who wrote a book that um, specifically addressed gun violence as a public health issue. And I'm sure that the mental health part of the bill probably addresses some of that, but I'm wondering if this issue specifically um, might be addressed in here as it would be a much different critical lens to look through the problem with. Uh, happy to start. So yeah, gun violence definitely is a huge issue, and as we mentioned, HIA being living and breathing, we know that we're going to hear from a lot of congressional offices to include their members' bills on the issue, uh, not to mention my boss is working with uh, Rep. Espaillat on calling for a public health emergency on gun violence. So in all those aspects, uh, it is already included in HIA, and especially from a community-based intervention approach. Uh, I think a lot of what the bill does is making sure that we are empowering communities, and oftentimes that looks like funding, uh, and making sure that trickles down to the right places, our trusted messengers, our community-based organizations. So um, yes, <laughs> and happy to follow up as well. Yeah. And then if we can get the table here. Hi. Um, hi, Adam. Thanks for your work, and thank you, everyone, for your work on this critical um, legislation. My name is Alisi Tulua with Asian American Futures, formerly with the Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander Data Policy Lab. Um, my question is, uh, during the pandemic, we saw uh, how crucial community health workers were. Um, and I can speak to the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander community. Um, I know in, in years past, you know, uh, specifically when the ACA was being worked on, it was hard for our communities to advocate for CHWs to be included in many of the language around health workforce diversity. Um, but we saw during the pandemic how crucial they were in serving our community to access health care. Um, can you talk about the parts um, in HIA where um, health work diversity is considered and whether community health workers are written into some form of um, institutionalizing uh, them knowing how effective they are for our communities? Well, okay. 
Uh, I, I'll start and then Erica, I'll, I'll pass it over to you. Uh, so thank you, Elise. Really appreciated all the work that you did uh, during the pandemic and that you continue to do. Um, CHWs are specifically included within Title III of, uh, of HIA. Uh, that does address the health workforce diversity. Uh, we know that uh, CHWs are critical, continue to be critical for addressing uh, the challenges that our communities specifically face. It is a uh, a priority for APTRO as well in wanting to ensure that we see some of the flexibilities and the, the funding that was extended during the COVID-19 pandemic be extended uh, beyond. Uh, we know that there is also a critical funding, uh, funding cliff that's coming up uh, towards the end of the year and we wanna try to get provisions within HIA that can specifically address those funding cliffs uh, so that we can try to build it into either the end of the fiscal year package or the end of the calendar year package so that we can continue to support for uh, CHWs. Yeah, and um, yeah, I would say, you know, when we talk about healthcare providers throughout HIA, you know, the intention is really directing it towards and empowering our community uh, healthcare workers. So CH uh, community health centers uh, and the, the workers are really at the forefront of, you know, because that's where the culturally appropriate, linguistically appropriate uh, care does happen. So we definitely want to see more of that. Um, and, um, you know, what's really important about HIA is that it brings a lot of members together. And so we can work together on each of those issues. Thank you. Additional questions? Just one last question okay. on my end. <laughs> So I actually, I, I stand, I'm Alan Tolopai, I'm the president of the Pacific Island Chamber of Commerce. I have a struggle standing today because of the fact that I had a stroke in October. This hits directly to me. And I'm speaking on behalf of my, my Polynesian people in the fact that there's a misunderstanding in between the language of the healthcare system and the care of the system. We talk about barriers. And a lot of the barriers are the funding aspect, the insurance aspect. Why do we need, and I'd love, love to find out what your organization, why I would say our organizations. Because when you're sitting in that seat, you're representing us. And so the fact that you're there, we have a voice that can then change this concept of the health care to be care for the health. What are our organizations doing to promote that care is the first thing before trying to get a bill paid? Well, I will say, so absolutely agree with you. Uh, anytime we are putting forward policy recommendations or trying to address specific problems, we really are trying to put the patient, the individual first. And I think that's something that he, uh, and by extension, other pieces of legislation that everyone on this panel uh, ha is working on, uh, really tries to do. It's the reason, I think, why HIA, from its start, uh, wants to incorporate community voices, getting you know many community organizations, many advocacy organizations to come together on provisions uh, that can be agreed upon, but also that specifically address the unique challenges that communities of color, and not just communities of color broadly, but drill down specifically into how our Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders uh, experiencing the healthcare, uh, the health, uh, experiencing healthcare. Uh, how are they getting healthcare within the system? What are, what, you know, what are the barriers that they're experiencing, but what, how is it that we can fully address what those are in a way that matters most to how they experience, how we experience it? Um, and I think that's the reason why, again, here, the community working group that does the first drafting every single, con at the start of every single Congress, uh, starts with the community working group coming together and starting to rewrite the bill rather than having Congress or uh, the congressional offices give us text and having us respond to it. You know, we built off of what was introduced in the last Congress, but really the, the, um, the directives that we give to the title leads and by extension the community organizations who make up the title subcommittees is, is this right? Are we getting the provisions right for the communities that you serve? And if not, how is it that you recommend that we change it? How can we find consensus in order to make those changes to the bill? And if it means stripping out entire provisions, we tell them, feel free to strip out entire provisions. If it means adding entirely new sections, we say, add in those entirely new sections. Uh, it's what Jennifer was mentioning early on. 
when this bill was first introduced, it was nowhere near 2,000 pages. But we know because of the complexity of the healthcare system, it needs to grow, and it has grown, in order to meet the needs of individuals first, rather than you know, policy first. Yeah. And just to add to that, I want to underscore like the second part of this title of this bill is accountability. Like there is an onus on us to really advocate for you all and have you, like Adam said, at the seat at the table in the beginning as part of the community working group um, drafting the text of this bill. And also wanting to mention that, you know, this bill is addressing the social economic, you know, obstacles that we all face in trying to get the health care. And like you said, it's about the care part first, not just health. So recognizing that there are all these, you know, years of generational injustices that our communities have faced, specifically NHPI communities, like how are we grappling with that and trying to close the disparities that all our communities face? And not only communities of color, we also address, you know, our immigrant communities, you know, uh, women, children, families, um, finding the, all the intersections where the folks who have been underserved and left behind for years in this country, we can really try to um, holistically look at those throughout the HIA. Just, I, oh, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to respond, um, bringing in some of Senator Hirono's philosophy. Um, when we talk about, when I talk to her about health, um, she's always driven by what does the community say? Particularly, she understands um, that we, as our office, we need to be always upholding our native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities and all the policy that we do. So it was really important when we were um, kind of reaching out to our community, our different organizations to help us edit this bill, made it an intentional choice to reach out to extensive, like really rooted um, community organizations that work with the native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander populations for them to be able to review our work um, and be able to provide their input and, and tailor the work that we do in all parts of the titles um, to make sure that it serves the Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander community. And just to add, you know, the, the opportunity that HIA gives us, it's not about getting everything in writing and having it correct. You know, first step is to introduce it, make sure it's well represented, but no bill is perfect out there. But it's leverage for us, it's leverage for a community to say, hey, speaker, uh, you know, and each of the bodies of Congress or, you know, um, uh, any, any influencer uh, to say, these are hundreds of the communities, these are hundreds of members that are calling for this and joining and pushing for this. You cannot ignore us. And so that is, then we can talk about deeper issues once we have their attention. So it, it's, it's um, you know, as I said before, a symbol and one foot in the door to really make that change. Uh, and just one additional point following up on what Casey had to say in terms of accountability. I mean, there are, uh, and I think we need to collect these stories, there are numerous successes that came from 20 years of working on uh, different iterations of HIA. Uh, I was just thinking about, you know, at the end of the last Congress, uh, they passed uh, accountability provisions such that HHS can now enforce civil rights protections um, that are needed through the Medicaid unwinding process. That sounds small and technical. That's a huge step to give those enforcement tools. That didn't happen, but for these caucuses coming together and bills like this putting forth these issues and the voice for the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islanders uh, being louder, this is an incredible venue for that. So. Um, I think we're wrapping up here on time, and um, I think just in conclusion, thinking about 20 years that have, that have passed since this was originally introduced, like an incredible comprehensive effort. It's gonna be really exciting when it gets introduced later this fall. I think you know all of you in your various capacities, nonprofit, private, or otherwise, thinking about how you are gonna be able to um, add your additional input, lift up this legislation when it comes, keep thinking about what you're gonna want for the future, um, and then maybe just ending again with a thank you to APAX, but a thank you to the amazing congressional staff sitting up here who have worked tirelessly. I mean, if you hear the 
you know, 2,000 pages. Someone's reading those, compiling your input, uh, you know, drafting this, and Adam, too, has been shepherding this through the process. But I think a huge thank you to them and their bosses for the efforts that they've put through to, to introduce this legislation. So 